Welcome everybody. Um, my name is Cynthia Walker. I'm the director at the Brickstore Museum and um, this week we are going to be talking about Edith Barry who was the museum's founder in 1936. Um, I thought in these days of um, indoor activities <laughs> um, that I would take us on an 80-year journey um, at the turn of the 20th century um, and travel around the world with Edith Barry as she did um, throughout her life um, as she was lucky enough to have the uh, funds and the independence to um, travel a whole lot um, as we have discovered here at the museum thanks to her archives that are also um, held here. So um, just a little bit on uh, my background. I came to the museum as an intern um, and stumbled upon Edith Barry's um, life uh, and, and collections here at the museum. And the director at the time, Tracy Bates, um, had asked me to go through Edith's collections and basically um, put them in order and, and categorize them and things like that. And I was a um, graduate student at the time with a uh, museum studies master's program called the Cooperstown Graduate Program and I was in search of a master's thesis topic and obviously there was one sitting right in front of me with um, Edith's um, materials so I ended up um, writing about Edith's life and uh, what she produced from it so um, what was so intriguing about Edith <clears throat> is that she wrote um, painted and photographed uh, so much detail of the lives around her um, that the fact she wrote so little about herself and conducted so few interviews and wrote so little about herself in her letters and everything else um, that she herself remains a mystery but her world around her is incredibly detailed so um, after writing my thesis uh, for my graduate program on Edith's uh, basically photography and writings uh, in the early 20th century and the ethnocentrism um, voice that came out in those pieces uh, from Edith, um, I decided to write Edith's biography, which I am still in the middle of doing. I haven't, um, <laughs> I haven't achieved it yet, but we'll, we'll see how long that takes me. Um, the, the problem I've found with writing about such a well-traveled woman is that it uh, sort of becomes a, you know, tell me the history of the world um, moment. Um, just trying to imagine all of the immense changes that she experienced in her time of traveling in Africa and Europe and the Middle East um, and Asia, and even here in the United States, uh, when living in the early 20th century, saw immense changes to our ways of life. Um, so this project has become kind of a spider web of events and and uh, effects. So with that, I will start, and I'm going to close my little face here because I don't want to see me talking. <laughs> so here she is. This is Edith as a baby. Um, she was born uh, March 10th, 1884. She was the third child of a pair of people named um, Ida Morton Barry on the right and Charles Dummer Barry um, on the left, and both of whom uh, were descended from shipbuilding families who came from Boston and Kenny Bunk. Um, Charles' parents were um, Charles and Sarah. His father was a ship captain who was lost at sea when he was a baby, and his mother Sarah was the daughter of William Lord, who was the original owner of the brick store where the um, museum sits today. Um, Ida's father, Nathaniel Lord Thompson, was a ship captain and then a ship owner that amassed a large amount of wealth over his lifetime and was one of the most prolific ship owners in Maine. Um, Edith's uh, dad, uh, Charles Barry there on the left, he became an import-export agent with the Henry Peabody Company in Boston and then uh, that company moved to New York City. So the family moved from Massachusetts, uh, where Edith was born, to Montclair, New Jersey in about 1889. Um, so what I like to remind myself and, and others listening 
is that think about how cities and towns were changing right at the turn of the century, right in the 1880s and 90s, um, seeing new immigrants coming in in these large waves. So especially in a place like Montclair, New Jersey, which is so close to New York City, um, just imagine what it was that they were seeing at that time. So, um, you know, its proximity to New York um, certainly influenced Montclair's giant leap in population. Here they all are uh, sitting together. Um, they lived at a house at 83 uh, South Fullerton Avenue. So if anybody is from Montclair or knows of it, um, that house is still standing. Uh, as I said, she was the third child um, of four. And here are her brothers and sisters. Um, she had an older brother, Charles Edward Barry. He um, is there on the left. He attended Cornell University and earned his degree in electrical engineering and then began to work at his father's um, import export firm. She had an older sister, Elizabeth Lord Barry, who's there in the center in her wedding dress. The museum has that wedding dress in our collection and it's, it's always wonderful um, in any case to have both a picture of the person wearing their clothing as well as the clothing itself because it really humanizes the story. Um, Elizabeth's story is fairly hazy. Um, I'll mention it later, but in Edith's journals and writings, there's always a certain care taken when she's describing her sister. Um, Elizabeth's nickname was Bess. She appears to have some sort of health issue, but there's nothing anywhere that says exactly what it was. It was just there. Um, and also where her two sisters and her brother uh, all attended special preparatory schools. Uh, Elizabeth here attended Montclair High School, um, which I, I thought was interesting to note, especially in that time period. Um, she married a man named Norman Borden, who was from Fall River, Massachusetts in 1903. And if that, same, uh, that name sounds familiar, it, it is. Um, it's the same Borden family as the famous Lizzie Borden, um, <laughs> and Norman was a second cousin of Lizzie Borden. Um, Edith Barry's youngest uh, sister, and the fourth child of the family, is all the way to the right in this screen. Um, her name was Julia Lord Barry, and she was three years younger than Edith, um, but they appear to be the closest of friends of the four siblings, as usually happens <laughs> to most of us. Um, Julia married a man named Edward Bodman, in the 1910s and then made her home in Pasadena, California. Of the four children, only Elizabeth, the woman in the center of our screen, had children. Uh, Edith never married. Edward married, but much later in life, to a woman named Lillian McLean. Um, and then, as I said, Julia married, uh, but never had children either. I often get asked um, if Edith Barry ever had any suitors or callers or, you know, boyfriends or whatever. Um, and she did at one point. Um, let me see if I have that. Yeah. So I have been um, reading Edith's letters and journals for so long that a man named Edward, Edward, excuse me, Jaeger, um, <laughs> appears quite often in her journal from her late teens and early 20s, um, which he comes to her house often and she attends various dances with him. And um, one, one such night she wrote uh, of their, they had gone to some sort of um, group dance. And one such night she wrote, quote unquote, best night of my life, which to most of us um, would mean this was a very special person. But um, what happened to Edward is still a mystery. He kind of disappears from her journals after 1905. I found later that he um, married someone else uh, from Montclair in about 1912. Uh, um, and he kind of went on with his life. But this picture, he's the one who's in the foreground um, staring right at the camera. And of course, his um, face is obscured by the shadow of his hat. So um, he's still a mystery. So we'll have to, we'll have to keep looking. I'll say that after him, there are, was no mention of any male companionship whatsoever uh, for Edith. So 
<laughs> that's that's him. Um, I put up a couple uh, family photos of Edith and her her siblings because her mother, um, Ida, often wrote little narrations of how her children interacted at, at her house, um, which is such a funny thing to find. Um, sometime in 1890, six-year-old Edith Barry stood on the stairs of her family's Kennebunk summer home, which is um, still standing on Summer Street, listening to her sister, oops, um, let me see if I can pause that, listening to her sister, um, Bess, uh, in bed, who was in bed with the measles at the time, complained that she had not seen Edith for so long that she had almost forgotten how she looked. Six-year-old Edith replied, and I'm quoting here, I am a little girl with my hair cut short, a red dress on, and just as God made me. In another instance, Edith asked her mother if, when she died, if she would not go to try to bring her to, and do it quick before the soul had time to get out. She said she wished, wished George Washington would come back from heaven, and then we should know what it was like. As I said before, here's a couple of photos that <laughs> advanced a little quickly for us um, of Edith when she was younger. Here she is about age 12. The family always had pets, so um, you can see here she's holding uh, a kitten or a cat and um, holding up a treat for one of their dogs that they had. <laughs> uh, here she is at Kennebunk Beach. Um, I want to make sure this is still paused. At Kennebunk Beach, she's about 18 years old in 1902. Um, as I said before, the family often visited Charles Charles Dummerberry's mother, uh, Edith's grandmother, at her home in Kennebunk, and it eventually became their family summer home, which is called the Taylor Barry House, um, and it still stands on Summer Street um, today. So if you're driving down the street, it's the bright yellow house that looks much like this. This is a black and white photo in, from the 1930s, but um, still looks much like that today. Edith began her interest in art at a young age, and in 1899, at the age of 15, she won a prize for the best portrait of George Washington in the New York Sunday Herald. Um, her award was one dollar, and she continued to create drawings and comics for newspapers later on in her life. Um, but here is her first, you know, printed um, piece of art for the public. Here's a, a really neat picture of Edith um, when she was about 19 in a library. And I always just think it's very dramatic of her to be standing like that. She received her formal education at Miss Wheeler's School for Girls in Rhode Island from 1901 to 1904. Um, <clears throat> Wheeler School is still there. It's obviously um, developed from a girls' school. Um, but if you look it up, you'll be able to see that that school is still in existence in Rhode Island in Providence. Um, Edith, when she was there, she focused on artwork and painting. And honestly, in, in stark contract to kind of contrast to the stern-faced Edith that we see in later years, um, her journal is full at that time, is full of um, pranks she pulled, including, uh, you know, putting cayenne pepper in other girls' beds and sneaking up to the attic to have midnight parties with her friends. Um, she met several lifelong friends here, um, including a woman named Mary Remy, later uh, Wadley, who you'll hear about as we go down, down, down her uh, life here. But this is a really early uh, photograph of of the family visited Mexico in 1905. Um, so Edith is standing at the far right and Julia, her sister, standing in the black coat um, in Mexico. What I love about this picture is the man standing on the ladder in the, uh, at the left there. Um, obviously when they were in South America or, or going to South America in 1905, they stopped by, um, Cuba, and this is a Edith's photo of the USS Maine, which sunk um, in that area. 
again, another one of my favorite uh, photos of Edith. So she's the one who's um, kind of in the center of the photo. Her, as I said, best friend, Mary Remy, is standing to the right. Um, this is one of the only photos you'll ever see of Edith with her hair down, literally. <laughs> um, and they were just kind of fooling around uh, as young people do um, at school, but this is one of the most uh, wonderful pictures because she's just kind of her being herself. Um, after graduation, Edith traveled with Miss Wheeler and several other art students to Giverny, France to study and paint. Um, the group lived in a cottage that was right next to Claude Monet and often visited his gardens um, and once received an art criticism from the artist himself. And um, she didn't get a very art, good art criticism, but she was proud of it uh, nonetheless. And this is advancing without my wanting it to, but let's see. <laughs> um, so she studied specifically um, with artist, an artist named Frederick McMoneys um, and a couple other Impressionist artists who were American but living in France. These are two paintings that she created while she was in France um, that she later won awards for when she brought them back to the United States. I'll go back a slide because I wanted to mention that these were just simple sketch drawings that um, appear throughout her life that she kind of throws into her journals. Um, obviously, these are from different time periods, but the the darkest uh, drawing on the top uh, right is Julia and kind of taking a nap with her mom, uh, Ida, on a train as the family was traveling somewhere. Um, below that, there's a lion statue uh, that's in Luxem Luxembourg Gardens in 1913. Um, next to that is Edith's drawing some um, Asian headdresses that she saw on a train um, going between Korea and uh, China, I believe. And then the upper uh, left, you see she has a, um, a scene from Japan. So uh, after Edith got back from several trainings in France, um, it, it found her again with her family. Um, again, uh, Edward Yeager had kind of taken off by that point. So she was back um, to, to focusing on traveling, which then became the love of her life um, ever since. And um, she traveled around the US with her family. Um, oops, this is still going forward. <laughs> She um, traveled around the U.S. with her family, you know, stretching from um, New Jersey to Northern Maine and across the ocean again to England. First trip outside of Europe uh, came in 1912 over to 1913 when the entire family vis visited Northern Africa. Um, so we're lucky enough to have both her day journal of that trip and her photo scrapbook of her travels, which is wonderful. Um, be, because of her training in Impressionism, at least from my point of view, um, she was able to take these images of, you know, regular everyday life um, that Impressionists worked so hard to create in their paintings. So it's literally just a fleeting moment in an image. Um, her composition in these photos tells us that she knew what she was doing with the camera, but she also captured perhaps a subconscious bias sometimes um, that the majority of Americans at that point were, were carrying with them. So it, it's interesting to look at these photos now um, and remember exactly what was going on at the time in places like um, here, this picture in Egypt or Northern Africa or in Asia, when colonial powers were still controlling many of these countries. Um, so when Edith stayed, for instance, at certain hotels um, in Algeria, for instance, they were French citizens running these hotels and stores. So they were able to um, speak French a lot of the time, which obviously was helpful to Edith, but um, certainly was erasing the culture that was originally there. So here's a, we'll run through these images that she took. 
here's a view of Cairo, uh, 1913, from a hill, it appears. Um, just a regular family uh, traveling through Cairo in 1913. You notice that the mom is carrying a, a, a little baby there. There's a little boy hanging off the back of the cart. Here's a great one of a street scene in Cairo. Um, folks are just uh, sitting there. They're selling some wares. Um, and you can really notice, um, you know, the, the clothing that they're wearing, the background um, buildings, things like that. This is near Dendera, Egypt in 1913. Um, this is a great picture. You can tell she applied uh, her, you know, kind of artist's eye to this. I mean, you can just see it in the columns behind this little boy. Um, it looks beautiful. Here uh, is her brother who's sitting at the uh, left, her sister Julia and her dad, um, Charles, are sitting at the top of the Great Pyramid in Egypt um, with coffee and obviously these uh, gentlemen that are standing around them in white um, were, their, um, uh, were their basically guides for the day. Here is Edith at Thebes. Um, Again, one of the only photos that she actually took of herself on these trips. Um, so it's a pretty special one because she rarely is in any of the photos. Um, she's always the photographer. So to see a hint of her um, taking part in these adventures is always an interesting thing to see. Um, this is one of my absolute favorite photos of hers ever. Um, again, these are women just carrying water in Algeria in 1913. Number one, just the trick of carrying something like that on your head is pretty impressive. And the kind of ghostly appearance um, of these women appearing out of a, um, what is likely a, a watering place um, with the all black on is just a, a pretty impressive thing to see. Um, this is the bazaar in uh, Tunis. So in Tunisia in 1913, again, you can see a lot of different um, clothing being worn. You can see the crowded buildings and the things that they're selling, so that's always impressive. And now we reach um, about 1914, I hope this stays on there, um, where Edith, after that big trip, she returned to France um, to train as an artist once again uh, on June 22nd, 1914, and if anybody knows their World War I history, You'll know that six days later, on June 28th, Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated and World War II erupted. So her letter to her parents during this time was filled with narrations of sights and sounds and watching as um, the French army was uh, raised from villages that she was living in. Um, and her parents wrote back to her, insisting that she return home at that point, which any parent would do. But she only responded with detailed, more detailed narrations, <laughs> which I'm sure worried her parents even more, um, of France in wartime. So, for instance, one of the things that she wrote was, I, tr I trust that you are not worrying over me, for truly I am wonderfully comfortably fixed, and as long as there is war, it is quite interesting to be somewhat near it. So again, um, a worrying tone from a young woman um, at the time, but she uh, was able to stay there and in fact was delayed in getting out of France um, for about three months because of the um, all of the Americans trying to get home at that point. Um, there was just no room on any um, cruise or cargo ship that would actually take you home. So she was she was stuck there, as was um, other main artists like Mildred Burridge, um, who is a well-known main artist here. Um, was one of her good friends, and they were both stuck in France until Mildred's father, a Civil War uh, veteran, <laughs> actually uh, went over to France and helped them um, make their way home. So um, the pictures you're looking at now are Edith back in New York when she arrived home um, in 1914 in the fall. Um, she became a second lieutenant um, in the Women's Reserve Camouflage Corps, um, which was basically uh, women artists who joined the military. 
um, and they painted uh, and designed camouflage for the army's use or military's use. And here's a couple of shots of her um, of her training uh, around New York City. I don't know where that is, um, but here she is uh, at the the picture on the left, she is standing on the left, kind of holding that um, fake or false rifle. And the picture on the right, she's obviously trying to camouflage some um, plant life. After the war, um, Edith Barry uh, specialized in oil painting and produced commission portraits for New York City kind of high society. Um, and branched out into sculpture and engraving. Um, she won awards for her work with the Connecticut Academy of Fine Arts, Montclair Art Museum, National Academy of Design, the Chicago Art Institute, and several more. Um, and as her siblings all moved away from home in the 1910s, um, Edith purchased an apartment uh, and studio both in New York City. This picture is her uh, where her studio was or originally was in Vermeer Studios at 116 East 66th Street. It's hard to say. Um, <laughs> this was eventually, I think, torn down um, and replaced with other buildings in New York City. But um, this is where she originally um, had her studio and apartment. And she stuck around there um, most of the rest of her life in, in that area of New York City. So I'll just pause here for a minute um, and say that uh, one thing that surprised me when, when looking at Edith's history is that in all of her letters and journals from this period, especially being in New York City and a reader of national newspapers, um, Edith mentions nothing about women's suffrage, um, which uh, just surprised me, I guess, because my assumptions going in and that that proves you know everybody has their biases um, that we have to be aware of my assumptions going in as a historian were that she would mention something because she remained a single woman all her life um, was obviously very independent because she um, owned her own studio apartment um, you know had her own business and <clears throat> basically uh, traveled wherever she wanted to go by herself I assumed that that she would have some mention of women's suffrage, but she she said absolutely nothing about anything like that. Um, so I found it really interesting that her apparent, you know, modern view of marriage and women's independence was a separate issue to her than voting was, or at least she didn't mention, you know, she didn't relate it to that. So um, <laughs> right around that same time, she and her parents departed for their six-month Oriental tour in December 1919. They traveled by a ship from San Francisco, um, and this is the first time Edith visited Asia, anywhere in Asia. Um, and their trip was delayed once they got there because uh, her father, Charles, um, fell ill with an unknown illness, um, and they had to stay in Hong Kong for about a month. So here's a couple of images from that trip. Um, this is one of the first pieces that she put in her scrapbook. So it was, must have been just as they were arriving, <clears throat> excuse me, just as they were arriving on their uh, cruise ship. This one um, surprises most people who see this image. You can see that um, this woman, uh, is dressed in traditional garb, um, but also has um, bound feet, which is a disturbing practice to most of us today. Um, it was obviously a traditional practice in um, China at the time, um, mostly not today, um, but you can see that the tiny, tiny shoes that she is wearing. And one of the most um, amazing things, you know, horrific to many people, to look at is that Edith, uh, from her trip, she brought home um, a pair of miniature shoes that this it looked much like what this woman was wearing. So to see um, shoes that are about, uh, you know, three or four inches in length, um, 
your feet start to hurt just just looking at them. <laughs> so keep in mind that Edith um, is still using her uh, the, the lessons of her art training um, to capture these images. And here are men um, just seated right at the base of the Great Wall of China, once again in 1920. Um, I have not had the luck to go to that place, but um, folks that have been there um, have commented on this picture to say that they had never seen it so empty. So um, folks that have visited there, I leave that up to you. <laughs> Here is a, um, I keep trying to press pause because I don't want to skip over anything. Um, here are wrestling matches in third class on a steamer ship that, that uh, the Barrys were taking from China to Japan. Um, you can see all of these gentlemen kind of sitting there waiting for their turn or maybe it was after their turn. Um, and I just find it interesting that Edith decided to, uh, you know, photograph this going on. So once again, she was just trying to capture things that were happening around her and nothing that she was familiar with, <laughs> I would assume. Um, here are Korean children at a train station in 1920, um, very inquisitive of the camera, um, which is interesting to see of young people. Um, adults mostly try to ignore the camera <laughs> as they do today. Here's a Korean man um, with a white shirt on there and a Japanese woman at the train station. Um, I love seeing those boxes that are in front of the woman here as well as her hair. Um, it's very, it's just amazing to see and remember that these people, um, you know, this is about a hundred years ago now, um, in 1920, <laughs> that these people were existing and, um, you know, after this snapshot was taken, they moved on to the, the rest of their the rest of their lives. Uh, here's men on the riverbank in Shanghai in 1920. Have a little bird in that um, cage there. It's always an interesting thing to see. Sailboats at Nagasaki. Um, again, about 25 years before uh, World War II or 20 years. Planting rice in the Philippines in 1920 again. And a woman named Rosario, so she got her name from somewhere. Um, I'm wondering if she spoke with her, I'm not sure. Uh, walking through a crowd in the Philippines in 1920. Um, I'll pause for a moment, because that's her next, her next trip. So she didn't know it at the time, but that would be her last trip with her father. Um, I, I always think that the beginning of the 1920s must have been a hard time for Edith, um, but we didn't, we don't really know uh, since for the first time in her life, um, she didn't write anything about, about the 19, you know, beginning of the 1920s. She um, is kind of a, a black hole of information. Um, her father, Charles, died of a heart attack in a taxi cab that he was um, taking to New York City um, as, as he went to work um, in May 1921. And then her sister, Elizabeth, the, the woman who was standing in the wedding dress in the center um, a few slides ago, um, died of what are unknown causes um, eight months later uh, at the age of 43 in 1922. So. Um, those were incredibly sad years for Edith, I'm sure. Um, again, she didn't write anything um, at that time. Letters are few and far between and certainly didn't keep a journal. So her mother um, and Edith uh, went on three trips on the same ship called the SS Homeric um, to Europe each year between 1922 and 1925. Um, and I can only assume that this was part of their healing um, process after losing two of their family members um, nearly at the at the same time. So um, she she kind of went back and forth to Europe uh, several times in the 1920s um, and 10 years later, 1932, 
uh, her uncle, William Barry, who was a Kennebunk architect, he lived here in Kennebunk, um, he died and left the brick store building uh, that was built by her great-grandfather um, to Edith and her siblings. Uh, Edith's brother Charles hoped to sell it, um, but Julia and Edith fought to keep it and they won, which we have um, both of them to thank for that so that it became a museum a little bit later down, down the road. Um, we'll get to this image that we're looking at. Uh, on separate trips in 1933 and 34, Edith visited um, Asia and the Middle East, as well as, um, I didn't put any pictures in of it, but she traveled to Florida, uh, I think around 1935, and um, captured a lot of the tin can tourist uh, camps, which were basically um, people who had their own kind of RV wagons um, that were traveling around in the, during the depression. Um, and she captured a lot of those in sketches and pictures and it, it's very interesting to look at. So um, in these two trips to Asia and the Middle East. She uh, traveled with friends most of the time. And uh, here we can see an image from Aleppo, Syria, 1933. Again, Aleppo's been in the news for probably the past 10 years um, for the violence that's happening there. Um, so it's, it's very ironic to see this, this peaceful picture of it in 1933. Here is a um, Near, close to a beehive village. You can see um, the reason it's called that is the, the structures that are behind the gentleman standing there um, look like beehives. Um, also near Aleppo, uh, Edith is obviously in a car and these gentlemen are, are looking in at what, what she's doing. Um, and here's the outside of a beehive village as I was just talking about before with a family um, and a, and a camel, obviously, <laughs> that Edith um, was lucky enough to be invited to meet and see. Um, here's a view of Baghdad, Iraq, um, from the Tigris River in 1933. Again, I, I, I have not been there, but um, don't, I'm not sure if it still looks like this. As well as the uh, this uh, mosque that surprisingly, um, or not surprisingly, I, I guess um, wonderfully, um, is still existing in, in Baghdad. Um, this is an image of it, obviously in 1933, but if you, um, if you look up the Kadimiya Mosque um, in Baghdad today, uh, it just went through a, a renovation not too long ago, so it's, it's still there. <laughs> um, this is getting on, a, again, just a wonderful kind of quick image that she took of getting on a bus from Baghdad to Damascus, Syria um, in 1933. So all these children are waiting along with Edith Barry. Here's a musician in Karachi, Pakistan, uh, 1933. Again, just a, um, a really great picture, um, a portrait of a man um, that Edith was putting her art practice into her work. Here are veiled women in Karachi, um, which is just a uh, kind of a haunting picture, I guess. You can see the, the work going on in the background with all the military jeeps and everything else. Here's waiting for the train in Turkey. Most of these, um, you might be wondering where I'm getting the captions from. Uh, Edith uh, after putting these pictures in a scrapbook, um, she captioned them all herself in her handwriting or by uh, TypeScript. So, uh, Waiting for the Train was her title of this photo. <laughs> um, this one is perhaps the most haunting for all of us because uh, it's called, she titled it Digging the New Subway um, in Berlin, Germany. And of course, if you were in Germany in 1935, you would not um, most people would not have known what was to come, but all of us sitting in here in 2020 certainly knew <laughs> or know um, what was to come or starting to happen at that at that time um, in Berlin. So it's just kind of a um, an interesting picture to look at. 
Um, and this is one of my favorites, and, and really it has no context, but it's also in Damascus, uh, Syria, and the title uh, that Edith, excuse me, that Edith gave it was Waiting, <laughs> which is, that is true. <laughs> And again, another great um, expansive picture that shows her artistry um, and what she tried to put into practice in terms of impressionist um, kind of farmland painting. Also in, this was also in Syria. Um, this is her heading home, so crossing the Atlantic by steamship in 1935. Um, again, would not want to be on that ship. Uh, I'm sure Anybody who traveled in that day was used to um, the stormy seas like that, but for those of us that prefer um, airliners, um, that's not something that I would want to see. <laughs> so I put this one here because this is Edith um, in about 1936. Um, when she got back from her travels uh, to Germany, um, and Asia, her mother passed away in 1935. Um, and with the selling of their Montclair family home, um, Edith moved full time to New York City. Uh, and the siblings that remained, so Charles and uh, Julia and Edith, um, inherited the Taylor Barry house on Summer Street in Kennebunk. Um, so Edith would spend her summers there. Um, on July 1st, 1936, since she was in Kennebunk, uh, Edith Barry opened the Brickstore Museum on the second floor of the Brickstore building. So you can see on the right hand side of this picture, there's a stairway that goes up to the second story and a tiny, tiny sign above the door that says the Brickstore. Um, at the, the, um, the first floor of this building was the water district and she continued to loan it out or rent it out to them for a little while until she was able to take it over. And here's a uh, kind of slightly newer picture <laughs> of that same spot. You can see in those upstairs windows, you can even see the gallery lighting um, that's going on. And obviously the Brickstar Museum has taken over the entire, um, the entire building. It's also interesting to see that these, this building was not linked to the rest of the buildings as they are today, because that, that stairway to the second story is still there. So even though she was, or Edith was, the Brickstar Museum's director for quite some time, um, that didn't stop her from being an artist in her own right, as well as a traveler. Um, and in 1938, she was commissioned by the Works Progress Administration, we all know that as the WPA, to paint a mural on the wall of Kenny Bunk's then post office. Um, and the subject of that mural was arrival of the first regular mail in Kenny Bunk. So that mural is still hanging um, in what is now the uh, Kennebunk Police Department. So if you go in the front door of the police department, um, it is hanging right above the check-in desk. Edith also, this is a, um, this is a draft of what she did, but uh, that the museum owns. But she also in 1942 painted another mural at a place called the Soldiers and Sailors Canteen in New York City. I don't believe it's there anymore, and for sure the mural is gone, um, but this is at least a glimpse of what she planned um, to paint. Um, she did some traveling during World War II, but it was all restricted to um, North America, um, and she spent quite a bit of time in Sarasota, Florida, um, where she developed a love for the circus and that really inspired her creativity. So um, it's interesting because <laughs> right in the middle of that, um, in, in 1948, she uh, wrote a letter to a Mr. Joseph Sayward um, who was working on the new um, main turnpike at the time. Um, and he was on the board of the trustees of the Brickstore Museum at that time. And she said, now that your Herculean task of planning and creating the new superhighway is complete, I can feel that I can approach you. And basically the rest of her letter was, uh, she wanted to retire as director of the museum to be able to focus on her artwork full time again. <laughs> 
Um, so this uh, piece of work <laughs> shows her love of the circus. Um, it's called, uh, the title of this piece is called Leopard um, because of the uh, ribbon basically on the hat of this woman down in the uh, bottom of this picture. And if you ever see it up close at the museum, um, Edith has done a spectacular job of kind of painting the smoke uh, from this woman's cigarette. Um, this was a real woman. Um, she, was a, she was a professor, I believe, at Dartmouth. Um, and she was sitting in front of Edith's um, four-panel um, <laughs> Bringling Brothers Circus mural that she, she did, and the museum has it in our collection. It's gigantic and very heavy. <laughs> so in 1953, um, Edith joined what was called the Coronation Cruise, a trip that took her across the Atlantic to Queen Elizabeth's coronation. And in a letter to her brother, she wrote, I think this is my 24th crossing, and I have been many of the places on this trip once, and often several times before. I realize how fortunate I have been. So in this photo, um, Edith is sitting in the center of the table staring right at the camera. Um, she's a very imposing lady. <laughs> um, and certainly a contrast to what we were seeing in her younger days. <laughs> so back home and still on the board of the Brickstore Museum, she helped realize the museum's need for more space. And she purchased the remaining buildings on the block in 1958 and hired a carpenter to join them all um, inside. So that's why we have the buildings that we do today, all thanks to Edith. In the 1950s, Edith went on several trips with her old Wheeler School friend, Mary Remy Wadley. Um, this would be the first time she flew on airplanes to travel abroad. So think of that. Um, you know, she was in her, um, basically almost her 70s, um, before she got onto an airplane. So that, that's pretty impressive um, to have the type of patience to be able to travel <laughs> mostly around the world on, on ocean liners um, up until that point. So um, the one that I'd like to mention, she went on several trips, but this one was called Around the World in 80 Days, as you can see from this framed map um, that was drawn by Edith and now is in the museum's collection. Um, it's literally exactly what they did. They traveled around the world in exactly 80 days. Um, they didn't intend for it to be 80 days. It just ended up that way. So um, I'm going to read a poem that Edith wrote um, about their journey because it'll kind of cover the main points of it without me um, droning on. But as I'm reading, you can see uh, on this map that she basically drew out how they traveled um, to each spot. You can see little airplanes and ships, as well as the little points of interest that they stopped at um, on each place. So here is Edith's poem of their trip. Greetings. September 1st in 58, Labor Day was the same date. We left New York a sunny day to fly Sabina on my way to Brussels, Rome, and further down, an Africa of great renown. With guide and cook, a Bedford safari car we took to view the wild game from on top and photograph them at each stop. Once in the bush, a rhino charged and straight away in the car she barged. When next some elephants came our way, we thought we best no longer stay. Four times the equator we passed over to visit several countries more. At 40 places we spent nights on, on ocean voyage and 20 flights. We kept on schedule for it pays. We reached New York in 80 days. So now until our next safari, happy meetings, Wadley Barry. <laughs> An entry in her journal, um, Mary Wadley uh, had a journal, and she wrote of the beginning of their safari, um, this passage, which, I've, which I found uh, interesting. So I'll read that aloud. After lunch on the third day after arriving in Nairobi, a Bedford safari car arrived as per our 
itinerary with a chauffeur, David, who spoke English. The car resembled our army jeep and was built for rough roads or no roads at all. David sat in front, we on leather seats in the middle of the car, with places to brace our feet and leather straps to cling to when we struck the bumps. Provi provisions, blankets, etc. were in the back. This was the start of the most exciting part of our trip and the real safari. The main roads were two lanes, like ours, but when we struck the country ones, they were very dusty and dry. We went for miles over the veld, seeing almost no one passing and occasionally a car. We would then quickly put up the windows to escape the cloud of dust approaching and as quickly open them again as it was very hot and dry. After several hundred miles, we came to our stop for the night at Max Inn, a desolate place called Tito Andai. We each had a separate rendezvous with a private bath and only a short distance from the main inn where we went for dinner. Edith, in a suit, hat, and veil, looked immaculate as if garbed for Fifth Avenue. David said to me, you look tired. <laughs> I certainly looked something with my ginger-colored hair from the dust, which took two shampoos to erase and felt ashamed to look tired and be a sissy. But it's wonderful what a hot bath and a night's sleep will do, so we were all ready for an early start the next day for Marangu on the slope of Kilimanjaro, 19,000 feet, and the highest mountain in Africa. <laughs> this trip um, produced only color, the only color photos Edith ever took. Um, quite literally, as I said, on the 80th day of their trip, they landed back in New York City. And the pair traveled to Europe through the African continent across the Pacific Ocean again in 1959. So um, kind of about six months later, they did uh, the same route, visited different stops though. So here's a couple pictures, as I said, in color. Uh, these came off of slides that she, she was showing folks. Um, so this is a World's Fair they stopped at in Brussels, Belgium, before they took off on their tour. And here are um, the next two are pictures of planes, just because I, I think it's so amazing that she um, waited so long to take an airplane. So this is an airplane in Lucknow, India that they took, as well as uh, at the airport in Nigeria. This is a shot of Johannesburg in South, um, South Africa, again in 1958. Uh, men rowing in Benares, India. This is in Bangkok, Thailand. This is a uh, Fisherman's Wharf, San Francisco, so it might be a little more familiar to us. <laughs> this is one of the most uh, amazing pictures that she took on this trip anyway. This is on the Ganges River in India, um, where several folks are bathing. We saw that one. Um, <laughs> I always find this funny because this is a sign that Edith, I think, um, borrowed, um, aka stole, um, <laughs> to put in her scrapbook. Um, but I went so far as to make copies of this and I put them on, um, the staff might tell you, I put them on uh, computers and various things at, at uh, the museum to be funny. Um, but it says basically, uh, beware of thieves, guard your money, don't rely on any locks, hand valuables into the office for safekeeping, you've been warned. Um, these little cards Edith and Mary, Mary found um, at places of, uh, of residence when they were staying at hotels, so um, I always found that amusing. Here's a man and a monkey in Karachi in Pakistan um, in 1958. Keep in mind, Pakistan, I believe, had just become a country or would become a country um, really soon, right, right after uh, Edith's visit here. Here's um, uh, right on their safari um, in Tanzania, or Tanzania, yeah, um, in 1958, got to see some lions. And Maasai women uh, near Nairobi, Kenya, 
1958. Again, just a beautiful, simple shot, um, a portrait shot of, of people, regular people living there. Um, pulling hay in Agra, India. And that takes us to the last, um, kind of the last big quote unquote uh, vacation or trip that she took. Um, and this one was with just her younger sister, Julia, in 1961. Um, and Edith, again, she was born in 1884. So she was, um, she was getting up there in age, but she was, she and her sister wanted to go to Spain, so they went. Um, they flew to Spain and, and um, stayed there for a month and then returned. And she, Edith, as she always did, um, kept a journal while she was there, um, talking about the things that they saw and, and what they did. Um, they, Edith even includes uh, her dog <laughs> at that time, Judy. Um, I didn't mention this before, but Edith kept dogs all her life. Um, and she was a huge fan of animals, um, and a lot of her sculpture work um, features animals as well. Uh, one of her favorite dogs, <laughs> whose name was Topper, um, is featured as uh, several bookends and uh, brass sculpture um, in the museum's collection, so she was a big dog fan. Um, she actually kept um, mostly either uh, uh, Boston Terriers when she was younger, or um, uh, basically uh, some type of bull terrier uh, when she was uh, an adult, which is which is fantastic. Um, Edith Barry passed away in Biddeford um, in 1969. Um, her funeral service was held at the Unitarian Church just across the street from the museum. And she's buried in Hope Cemetery beneath a stone bench uh, that she had commissioned 20 years before her death. So she knew what she wanted, um, which doesn't, shouldn't surprise anybody. Um, her sister, Julia, um, had survived uh, all the rest. Um, and she passed away in 1972, three years after Edith. And the pair of them had bequested their home, their summer home in Kennebunk, the Taylor Barry House. Uh, to the museum, as well as a significant amount of funds to conserve objects for the future. Um, so the museum was able to run the Taylor Barry House as a historic home uh, with tours and things um, for quite some time, and then in the early 2000s it was decided that um, it was no longer um, good to do that. So in a variety of ways. So the museum sold the Taylor Barry House um, back to a private family in the early 2000s. Um, and it has been beautifully kept ever since. Um, and Edith's legacy of local history, art, and culture continues here at the museum. Um, and I'm proud to say that we remain one of the only 21 museums in the entirety of the United States to be founded by a single woman um, out of a total of th about 35,000 museums um, nationwide. So we're one of a very few. Uh, we have Edith Barry to thank for that, and I hope you enjoyed uh, this afternoon's tour. <laughs>